thank you so much for inviting me to join you today. And thank you again, Andrea, for that very kind introduction. So today in this talk, Augmenting the City Together, I'm gonna to share some examples of digital heritage projects I created with my students in collaboration with local communities. And each project is focused on augmenting a city in a different way, using game technologies and co-design approaches. And I hope to open up possibilities for how we think together about collaboration across the academic and research space in games in particular, and the future of the city. I find a lot of inspiration in the landmark work of Jane Jacobs, which also has wonderful resonance with the, the uh, very interesting keynote we heard this morning. Um, and, and Jane Jacobs' perspective on the role of diversity in city planning, identity, and sustainability in particular. So Jacobs sees the city as this kind of diversity generator that is also in need of diversity as a kind of fuel to sustain itself, uh, to sustain the role of the city as a social and cultural innovator and sustain democracy. She famously advocated for participatory methods in urban design planning. Now, Jane Jacobs isn't the normal required reading for game design research, which is the field I come from. Uh, but I know she's, she's part of the canon in your field if you're one of the folks joining from, from urban planning, cultural planning. But, um, but I think maybe she should be considered more in game design research because of her perspectives on participatory methods, which I think are also relevant for how we think about game design methods, particularly when working in the space of the city. Uh, but you don't have to take my word for it. I'm gonna play a short clip of Jacobs herself speaking about the concept of the creative city, a city as creative of innovation and the importance of diversity of every kind for the health of the city and democracy really as Jacobs sees it. This is a short clip from a TV interview in Vancouver from the early 2000s. Cities are places where most innovations start, most new ways of doing things uh, that can range from services to objects, to, to styles, everything, and cultural things, and so on. Problems show up first in big cities, every kind of problem. Uh, and always have, that that stimulates people to think of how to deal with these. Um, so uh, in, with respect to innovations, cities are the engines. If there's one word that describes what a creative city is and an uncreative city or other settlement is not, that word is diversity cultural diversity, uh, it includes ethnic diversity, it includes diversity of incomes and skills, every kind of, of diversity you can think of, and the more, except illegal diversity. And the more there is in the city, the more promising it is, because these all can serve as bases for new ways of doing things and for working together. So, so Jacobs here is talking about the new innovation and so forth. And you might be thinking, you're gonna talk about digital heritage work. What does this have to do with focusing on the past? Well, here's the link. Here's, here's a, a sculpture that stands outside the National Archives in Washington, DC. And this, uh, this symbolic woman here is meant to represent future. But the quote on the pedestal is from Shakespeare's Tempest. And of course, it's about the past. What is past is prologue. So part of developing and fostering diversity in our cities is not only about looking forward to coming innovations and development, but also in the work of looking back, work like preservation uh, of literal buildings, but also preservation of our heritage and histories. And, and here, I think games can play an interesting role perhaps in helping us to find new ways uh, of understanding things about our cities, like uh, understanding our colonial pasts, understanding the fraught history of mid 20th century urban renewal, uh, for example, and, and for understanding often untold histories of creative, sustainable, emergent outsider urban design that may be very uplifting histories here, but they're little known. I'm gonna come back to, to each of these topics uh, with some projects as I move forward. But, but as Jacob 
uh, Jacobs advocates, the way we work to understand and preserve our own cultures should be participatory and collaborative. And this might not always look like an urban design planning charrette, right? Uh, but that's great. Sometimes it might look like co-designing play with and in the city and its histories. And in terms of co-designing play with and in cities, uh, academic games programs may offer a unique source of creative collaboration for urban planners and city planners to consider partnering with. Now, of course, not all games are great for providing reflective experiences related to the city, its histories, or possible futures. So here's a screenshot of the classic city building game, SimCity from 1989, which is more about a flow dynamic than any kind of thoughtful or reflective development. Uh, and Jacobs too calls out that kind of Sim City perspective on building as misguided. She she wrote in Downtown uh, is for People that citizens who should know better are so fascinated by the sheer process of rebuilding, the end results are secondary to them. They have the logic of egocentric children playing with pretty blocks and shouting, "See what I made!" But games can also be used for reflection about what has already been built, why we see what we see, what has been erased what we valued in the past and opening up conversations about what we wanna value moving forward into the future. So just like the design of any type that seeks community engagement can't be developed in a vacuum. Uh, although that is still a pervasive practice using all kinds of tools for avoiding actually engaging other people like user stories and personas. Um, Jacobs points out urban design also can't be developed in a vacuum, famously encouraging people to get out and walk the city and spend time in it and, and be present. And in the closing of that landmark essay of hers, Downtown is for People, Jacobs gives this kind of list of important questions for citizens to ask of developers with this question as the summation of them all. In short, will the city be any fun? And here's a natural link between Jacobs thinking and games. So we might think about how, yes, as Jacobs says, Downtown is for People, we might also frame our understanding of the city by saying downtown is for play or downtown is for the player or players or a community of play. So with this, this background, drawing some connections between Jacob's approach to urban design and games. And as I said, I think there's a lot of resonance between the keynote from this morning. I'll now share some projects with you and some lessons I've learned from working in this space over the past several years. So I've been exploring the design space of digital heritage games and mixed reality the past several years in a project course that was called Augmented Reality Design for Cultural Heritage, which I taught at my prior institution, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, also known as RPI, in upstate New York. And as Andrea mentioned in her introduction, I just recently moved this summer to, uh, from there to Sweden, to University of Florida. So this course at RPI was supported, I should mention, by National Endowment for the Humanities Connections uh, Curriculum Development Grant in critical computing. So to develop an integrated humanities arts and computer science curriculum that incorporates humanities, critical cultural theory in hands-on computer science education uh, to kind of push back against the common split in STEM education that seeks to kind of divorce pedagogy from culture and politics. But in this course, a key strategy for bridging that gap across the humanities and STEM is to take the students off campus into the community to develop augmented reality heritage projects where right away the students can see and experience the ways in which their work and their own identities always already intersect with culture and politics, uh, structures of power and oppression, and can try and help participate with communities in, in liberatory work. Mixed reality games and heritage, I think, have uh, kind of almost uh, an alchemical potential to achieve in interesting ways uh, in our moment today in which technology like AR has gained a lot more acceptance uh, with the popularity of things like Pokemon Go, the tools and techniques for augmented reality design and game design have become a lot more accessible and widespread. And I think the layering potential of these mixed reality technologies has some advantages for heritage work in terms of expressing the layering of histories, multiple histories, the layering of multiple perspectives, uh, even the ability to interact with fragile or archival objects in a kind of simulated and non-destructive way. The interactive storytelling aspects of games too, I think uh, is pretty exciting for, for telling heritage and the ways in which a game framework can reach out to the player to invite them into the story, involve them, even cast them in a role uh, has, has some pretty exciting possibilities. 
So, so in this augmented reality design course, what we do in the space of one semester is to deliver a functioning prototype along with documentation to the level of what can be included in a grant application for the client community partner we work with. And before I go into the projects, I'll step back for a second and just provide a quick note on augmented reality technology and what it is in case you may not have come across it before. So you can think about augmented and virtual reality as existing along a spectrum from the completely physical to the completely virtual. And augmented reality is kind of in the middle there. It's a layering or blending of digital content in the physical world. Here's another image, a comparative image to kind of show you this difference. So in augmented reality, uh, you see virtual content like in a heads up display in the image, but you also see through to the physical world. Whereas in virtual reality, your whole experience is computer generated. Here's another image showing that difference. So uh, on the left, uh, you've got the woman wearing Google Glass in this case, that's augmented reality. You can see the user's eyes. She, she looks through a virtual overlay to also see the physical world. And on the right, you've got uh, the fellow wearing the Oculus Rift head banner display, which is virtual reality in which the user is hermetically sealed in a computer generated environment and not interacting with the physical world in the same way. So I hope that provides a, uh, a helpful background. So in my augmented reality design for cultural heritage course, students make all kinds of projects. Uh, and these are images of examples of some of the past projects. I, I won't have time to go through all the projects with you, but just have pulled out a few. Um, and if this looks pretty eclectic, that's because it is eclectic, reflecting the eclectic mix of students in the course. So the course um, is a cross-registered graduate student and undergraduate student course. Uh, so it's got both, uh, you know, really advanced students and younger students. Um, it's an elective, so it, it, it gets an interesting mix of people, usually a good number of game students, game design students and computer science students, but also often has students from art, music, architecture, creative writing, engineering, IT and web science, and even one semester included a graduate student, student in archival and library science from a neighboring university. So it is a wild and fun uh, interdisciplinary mix of students. And here you can see the selection of the clients uh, or community partners and topics that we worked with in this course over the past six or seven years. So we see some local historical societies, a state office of historic preservation and municipality, uh, library and archives and a museum of science and innovation. So now I'll share a few projects with you uh, that I think are particularly relevant in terms of augmenting the city. So in this first project I share with you was, was made for the New York State Office of Historic Preservation to reflect about the history of urban renewal in our area of Albany, New York and Troy, New York. So you can see on this 1960s map of New York State, there's Albany and Troy just opposite each other across the Hudson River. And if you follow that line of the Hudson River south all the way downstate, you've come to the island of Manhattan where New York City is there at the bottom of the map. Albany is actually the capital of New York State, uh, although New York City uh, certainly commands a lot of attention. But, but Albany is the capital and it's about two and a half hours north of New York City by car. And the history of urban renewal in the mid 20th century in this upstate New York area is really a, a dramatic and traumatic history and not particularly well known. So I'll share it with you. The governor of the state at that time, Nelson Rockefeller, you can see his picture there at the top of the map, happily proclaiming all roads lead to fun in New York State vacation empire. The, uh, the state is known as the Empire State. Rockefeller was very much in line with city planner Robert Moses' way of thinking about urban renewal. And he shared this kind of high modernist vision for how to transform the mid-century American city. And that's what he wanted to do for Albany and, and he did it. So in Albany, what this meant was the construction of a brand new center for the state capital in 1965. You see there on the right, Empire State Plaza, inspired by the city of Brasilia and also created by the same architect, Oscar Niemeyer. And that's what it looks like today on the right there, this massive monument in gleaming white marble to the power of the state. It has an enormous footprint right in the uh, city center of Albany. And it was developed to facilitate ease of entry and exit from the city by car from suburbs, but, but effectively walled off the downtown from the riverfront, which still has not been developed properly. And it really came at a huge cost because this is what was there before on the left in the black and white 
photo. That's a 1948 aerial photo on the left. And what was there before was a vibrant, multicultural kind of Brooklyn-like neighborhood of brownstones and row houses and mixed use uh, commercial uh, development too, which Rockefeller had declared a slum and seized by eminent domain and raised to the ground, uh, displacing roughly 9,000 people to build this marble Empire State Plaza as it's known today, which you see on the right. So uh, because these images are taken from different angles, I've just overlaid the 19th century Capitol building in a red rectangle and the Hudson River in blue. So you can kind of orient yourself um, to see what was there and how it looks now. Now at the same time, just across the river in Troy, similar pushes for urban renewal were underway, but with a different outcome, interestingly. So there was a proposal to take that same highway that fed into these underground tunnels in the plaza in Albany and route it right across the river and through the middle of Troy's downtown to accommodate that a beautiful train station, which was designed by the same architects as Grand Central Station was demolished and other buildings, including brownstones and more. But the highway was never put through, thankfully. And, and today Troy remains a delightfully walkable, uh, vibrant city. Uh, in no small part due to the resistance citizens there organized to stop the highway. So just as Jane Jacobs did with Robert Moses plan to run a highway through Greenwich Village. In Troy, an architecture professor at our university, at RPI, uh, became a key figure in leading the new movement in preservation and his name was Bern Forrester. So as the students in my class <clears throat> were researching this history of urban renewal, they, um, they met with the doc local documentary maker, Mary Paley, to learn more about the neighborhood that was destroyed in Albany. They also started visiting county historical society archives to research what happened in Troy, but they ended up right back at our own school archives learning about Bern Forrester, which we hadn't expected. Uh, so as I said, he was a, a faculty member at our own school and the Dean of Architecture at one point, and his papers are held by the school archives. And he was an incredibly creative person publishing books and making films, all with the aim of increasing awareness about the need to preserve old buildings and to preserve the authentic spirit of Troy with a, and met with a lot of success. As they were looking through his papers and collection in the school archives, they came across this book he had published called Man and Masonry. And it's a beautiful coffee table book about masonry all around the world. When you turn to the back, there's a sleeve with an LP in it. And the students were so surprised by this. It turned out he had, Forrester had commissioned a, a original symphony to be written that, that he intended the reader to listen to uh, as an accompaniment to reading this book and looking at these images of uh, masonry and the history of masonry around the world. And so the students felt this was an example of a pre-digital augmented book and became very excited by that and decided that one part of their project would be an augmented book using contemporary technology. So I'll show you a little bit of this now. So they came up with this idea of a fictionalized lost file uh, that would be a lost file of Burn Foresters that uses all kinds of archival film, audio and object reproductions, plus an interactive map to tell this story of urban renewal in Troy. And I'll show you some of this demo video now. So this, this shows the view looking through the screen of a phone. And so you can see both the physical uh, file and the digital overlays that come up and are available to you. And things like this interactive slider let you uh, see when buildings rise and fall in Troy on this map. And those buildings are, uh, the 3D models are actually textured with archival images of those buildings, which is kind of an interesting choice the students made. And then uh, it, on the other side of the folder here, there's all these reproductive uh, reproductions of different kinds of artifacts that help tell the story about urban renewal. That was a train schedule. And you get to take a look inside Grand Central and compare it with uh, a look inside the, the old Troy train station, the old Troy Union station that was torn down. And there's some other artifacts in here too, a fictionalized return to sender envelope. Uh, from some brownstones that really were torn down. Do you see that? Well, I don't know. There's been so many people that have been thrown out of their homes and everything. It's just something that 
And that's footage from a well, documentary. I'm sorry, I don't know. I, I had to get to drive a nail here because I'm afraid they'll come up the next morning and tell them they're going to take the house. Well, I would find out, wake up anymore, find out the floor goes or not yours then. <laughs> so that gives you a little sense of that part of the project. The students also created an intervention for Empire State Plaza, uh, which you know still is the capital of New York State, uh, specifically for this network of tunnels that run underneath the plaza. So there's an immense underground parking structure where the uh, overpasses from the highway from the suburbs come in. Uh, and there's this uh, huge under underground parking deck and then all these tunnels above that that kind of ferry the state employees between the underground parking complex and their high rise offices you know, so they don't ever have to enter the city space. Uh, these catacombs are now a massive public repository of Governor Rockefeller's personal high modernist art collection, which he housed, housed here to kind of educate the masses. Well, in this intervention, uh, the AR application on your phone covers and replaces these modernist artworks with the archival imagery of the neighborhood that was destroyed to make way for the plaza. So uh, kind of a, a reclaiming there. Uh, side note, modernist artworks work really well as image trackers, incidentally, <laughs> given their high contrasts and bold patterns. Um, and, and the students also worked with the local historical society in Troy to make an augmented reality uh, teaser trailer, self-guided urban renewal walking tour with this very nicely designed booklet. You see some of the pages up here. Photos bring up audio narration by tracking off that with your phone. And this was all to advertise the full length uh, urban renewal walking tour with the county historian. So at the end of this course, we presented these prototypes to the New York State Office of Historic Preservation. And, and while they were very happy with the prototypes, um, they did not see a way forward to develop the projects for the public. So the, pro the projects did not move forward. And this is something I'll come back to later because I did learn a lesson through that experience. Following that project, one of the students from the class, whose name is Kyle Ring, wanted to develop this kind of work further in an independent study capacity. And around that same time, I had been approached by the head of another local historical society who heard about this urban renewal project. And she was hoping we'd partner with her organization. This was Stephanie Woodard and the Rap Road Historical Association in Albany. So the Rap Road community is a group of African-American families that came to Albany, New York during the period of great migration in the 1920s and 30s leaving their homes in Djibouti, Mississippi due to increasing racist violence in the, in the region. They were led by a pastor, uh, Louis Parson, and another community member, William Tolliver, who purchased a large parcel of land right outside Albany and brought many families there to settle the area. Now the families came under duress uh, with very few material resources and the community relied on the engineering, architectural, entrepreneurial and agricultural knowledge of its own members to build an entire neighborhood of homes by hand, plant extensive gardens, build a community smokehouse, start businesses and thrive. And the community has continued to grow today, also preserving many of these original family ties. It's very uplifting, but little known history in our area. And so working with the community through a series of co-design workshops, this AR project was developed as an augmented book for use with phones and tablets. So the workshop centered on an exchange of expertise and creativity that was a two-way exchange. So Kyle and I shared our knowledge of AR with the community. We helped provide them with skills so they could use and design AR for themselves. And the community members in turn gave us insight into their history, how they wanted their story to be told, why they felt it was important, why they were drawn to augmented reality and who their audience would be. The family ties of the community um, surfaced as this all important vibrant bond that is that has endured and continues very impressively. So the project ended up being designed in the style of a family photograph album. That design metaphor really fit with the identity, the particular identity of the community. And this augmented photograph album combines documentary footage from one of the community members uh, documentaries, Todd Ferguson, has made a film about the, the history of Rap Road called Crossroads, the history of Rap Road. The book incorporates uh, audio recordings of oral histories with residents and photographic imagery, maps of the community throughout the years. So the album is used today by the Rap Road Historical Association. They continue to add to it and they use it as a public education tool at heritage events in the region, which you can see an image of there. <clears throat> 
So I'll share one, one final example with you and then some, some uh, overall reflections. So the last example I wanna share with you from this course was uh, one in which the students, my students worked with the city of Cohoes, <clears throat> which is a small municipality about 10 minutes from the RPI campus. And the mayor's office had put out a call for some kind of mural project, which they, they wanted to create a new mural uh, across from city hall. You see on the left of the slide, that's city hall. And on the right, across from city hall, there's a small pocket park and this exposed brick uh, wall of this building, which they wanted to remediate and develop with a new mural project. <clears throat> and in this call, they wanted some kind of interesting technological engagement with the mural. And to do all of this, to celebrate the town's history, that the, the theme of the mural should be historical uh, as part of a downtown revitalization plan. So we put in a proposal for an AR application that would interact with a new mural and the town accepted us and the mayor asked us to focus on the town's heyday, which, which he perceived to be the 19th century industrial revolution history of the town. <clears throat> so while we began researching the town on our own again, visiting local historical societies and archives, we also developed a series of workshops with the community to find out what histories were important to community members and how would they feel about the idea of an AR app and a new mural. So in a workshop at the senior center in the town, we had set up a bunch of different stations where people could engage with us. Um, one station educating about what AR is, examples that people could play with, an explanation of how the technology works. Um, another station with card sorting and conversation around how they envision the town and its histories. Another uh, map drawing psychogeography activity um, to share kind of affective maps of the town and their experience of it. And we found out the seniors in the workshop told us they could care less about augmented reality and, and any kind of mobile application. They flat out told us they would not use it, but they were very excited about a new mural. Um, and we also found out that they already knew the industrial revolution history of the town well. That wasn't something they felt a need to be educated on or um, delve into further. So we continued researching the town on our own and we ended up learning about the Native American history in the area. The town has a very large waterfall. It's second in size in the state only to Niagara. And you can see an image of it there on the left in that postcard. And it is usually highlighted for its hydropower history, powering mills during the Industrial Revolution. But it's actually the site of all of this uh, very important Native American uh, heritage and, and history. It's the site of the Iroquois Confederacy, which brought together six previously warring nations in 1450. It's an early example of participatory democracy and inspired Benjamin Franklin and others directly in terms of how to structure the US Constitution. Um, it, so, and it was also uh, the site of this two row wampum treaty, which you see an image of above the postcard, which was a mutual treaty agreement made in 1613 between represent, representatives of the Iroquois uh, Confederacy or the Haudenosaunee and representatives of the Dutch government. And this agreement is, is considered by the Haudenosaunee to be the basis of all their subsequent treaties with European and North American governments and the citizens of those nations. And it's still in effect. Um, the, the iconography and meaning of the treaty is poignant. The white bands represent peace and the purple bands represent two rivers flowing in parallel, but not intersecting. Meaning the agreement was to live side by side and respect each other and not interfere with each other's uh, culture. So sadly, as we know, on the European side, the treaty was not honored. Um, but, but, but interestingly, this, all of this Native American history was pretty much unknown by the townspeople. So what we wanted to know a lot more about it. So we hired a local Mohawk storyteller, Kay Olin, who also happened to be a retired school teacher and a really great educator to, to work as a consultant with us on an ongoing basis and teach us some workshops. So, we were learning here that sometimes uh, uh, a person is the archive. So, so Kay came to work with us and also worked with Ken Ragsdale, a colleague at RPI in the arts department who was designing the mural. And so Kay mentored Ken as he developed his design to incorporate some uh, natural features uh, of the town along with Native American iconography from the local Mohawk Nation and the Iroquois Confederacy. Um, as well as some of the imagery from the industrial past of the town. 
And we continued uh, des developing and running workshops throughout this time uh, in parallel. This time we went to Cohoes Middle School. Um, so that's uh, students uh, in sixth, seventh and eighth grade. And specifically we worked with the social studies teachers and their students. So that's like history class. This workshop proved more fruitful. The middle schoolers were fascinated with augmented reality and very enthusiastic about the possibility of using an AR app to learn more about the history of their town. And the teachers were on board too. Um, so you can see, I, I put the uh, agenda of what we did in, in the first participatory design workshop up because just to kind of demystify it, a lot of times I get asked, you know, that sounds, co-design sounds great, but what do you actually do? Um, so here's some of what can go on in a co-design workshop. Of course, there's lots of, uh, lots of ways to do it, but basically we provided an intro to augmented reality to demystify the technology um, and then had several creative structured activities to get the students thinking and sharing with us about their impressions of an experience of the town and, and what they might want in an AR application. So uh, one thing we asked them to do was sketch for us about their vision of the past of the town and their ideas for the future. Rebecca, and we saw that just a small request. You can slow down a little bit as well because there are not many na non natives. So I think. For oh, the I'm so sorry. I get excited. All right. <laughs> Perfect. But <it> <laughs> I will. Thanks for telling me, Andrea. Um, okay. So here you can see sketches of um, when we asked the middle schoolers to, to, to tell us about their vision of the past, what was important in the history of the town as they understood it. We also asked them to sketch their ideas for the future, what they would want or envision for the future of the town. We could see that their sketches about history in the town were dominated by a few things we saw again and again. They sketched the mills. You can see those kind of factory images there, the industrial history past that was very well known by the town. They uh, represented the Dutch settlers. You can see there that image in the upper right. And there was this enigmatic creature that kept appearing in sketches that looked a little like an elephant. Well, that's the mastodon. And we found out that that's a kind of uh, uh, mascot of the town when one of the largest mills was built in the 1860s and its foundation was being excavated, the skeleton of a prehistoric mastodon was found. And that skeleton's now in the State Museum, but there's a, a life size reproduction of the mastodon in the public library. So the students are familiar with this character and its beloved. But uh, then for the future of the town, uh, a major theme from the students was expansion more, more housing, more shops, uh, more restaurants, upgrades to the school itself. And one thing that appeared many times was more indoor spaces for kids to play sports because uh, it's upstate New York. The winter weather is not uh, conducive to playing outside. So those were things they were interested in for the future. Interestingly, there was no mention of the Native American history in the town in, in any of the uh, materials from, from the middle schoolers. We also did a kind of psychogeographic affective mapping activity with the middle schoolers and this was fascinating. So Cohoes is a really interesting town for a lot of reasons. Today it's a lower income town that has a lot of challenges. It has no busing. So all children walk to school at Cohoes. I mean, a few are driven by their parents, but the majority walk. So th these children's maps displayed these elaborate traversals of the town from home to school. Um, interestingly, with no representation of the massive waterfall. I was just expecting students to draw the massive waterfall, uh, but they did not. And again, no traces of the Native American heritage of the town came up for the middle schoolers in this representation of their experience. So when we talked to the social studies teachers about this, they shared that the Native American history was not included in the state curriculum for the school. Um, so there was some Native American history being taught. I don't want to give you that impression. It's just that the, the local history modules for the town of Cohoes and that the state curriculum did not include Native American history. And so it wasn't being taught. And, and this was something the social studies teachers were disappointed in. And they were thrilled about the possibility to have this free AR field trip to their own town uh, that an app could provide to incorporate this missing component in the curriculum. <clears throat> So then we, we continued to spend time in Cohoes on our own, uh, documenting the space of this is the pocket park uh, across from the uh, uh, town hall. And you see in the background there that brick wall, which is the site for the mural. 
And my students developed their ideas further. They created paper prototypes of the application. They brought this paper prototype back to the middle schoolers for another workshop to gather feedback. Here's a short clip of a video of my students rehearsing their paper prototype prior to going back to the middle school for a workshop. Yeah, this isn't final. Okay. Talk to my agent. Great. Um, and then you have that. Um, so what is that? So this is a QR code that you would hold your phone up to. Holding up to the QR code, this would appear in front of the QR code. Mm -hmm. You would press along with a button also appearing. You can press this. The screen would then switch to a game that you can then play with your phone. Well, what is the game about? So ultimately, the students um, designed what they called Discover Cohoes, uh, an augmented reality scavenger hunt game designed for mobile phones that interacted with this planned mural uh, for that pocket park and several other points of interest in, in the downtown. And the project was designed to complement the social studies curriculum so the game could be used as this no cost field trip opportunity for the middle school teachers since it, it is all within walking distance from the school. The town is, is really a small, it's a very small city. And they, uh, the students in my class designed four learning modules to this functioning prototype level or four stops in the scavenger hunt. And they designed uh, several further ones in, in, uh, in, in the documentation that was provided to the city. And you can see some images from a few of them here. Um, the, the mastodon, so beloved by the middle schoolers, um, the mastodon footprint is down there in the bottom middle. That was used as a custom tracking image throughout the app. On the left, you see an image of a Native American man carving a canoe out of white granite. And that was part of an interactive fiction canoe racing game, a vertically scrolling platform game in which you learn about the history of the Iroquois Confederacy and its connection to the story of the peacemaker. So the peacemaker who's pictured there is this central figure who initiated the Confederacy and came to the area sailing over Cahos Falls in a canoe carved of white granite and survived to broker peace between the Native American nations in the area. The students also developed a module related to the Harmony Mills. That's the very large uh, uh, mill. And today those are luxury lofts. Um, so they're really cut off from the city. You can't go inside them anymore or anything, but they were the economic engine of the town in the 1800s. And they also developed an interactive panorama of Silliman Presbyterian Church, which you see in a black and white image in the top right. That's what was once where the pocket park is. We found out that pocket park wasn't always a pocket park. A uh, church was there. People had actually fought to stop its um, demolition, but failed. And there was also a module on Cahos Music Hall. You'll see an image of that in the center. One of the few 19th century music halls still standing and still in operation as a theater today. And if you completed any learning module in, in this uh, scavenger hunt game, you could take uh, uh, your phone or tablet and stop by the public library to receive a cut and fold model as a kind of prize, uh, a cut and fold model of a local animal with cultural significance. You see the eagle there in the bottom left. Um, so a, a, an animal that we find locally that has significance for the Mohawk tribe in our area. And you can build the model yourself and there's additional information about the importance of the animal in Mohawk culture printed on the other side. So when we presented these, um, this prototype of the city, they were thrilled and intend to move forward with the project and have begun the process of remediating that wall to apply the, the mural. But then there was a big leadership change in the meantime and a new mayor, uh, actually a huge scandal, political scandal with the existing mayor that we had worked with. So the project's future is on hold for now. It's somewhat uncertain, but I'm, I'm hopeful that it could move forward. So just reflecting a little bit before I wrap up here, um, this is the basic process, no matter who we work with. Um, you can see it involves a lot of interaction with and listening to and designing with other people. Um, and I found this to be the most effective way to navigate the ethical complexity of telling other people's stories, uh, to navigate that with maximal transparency. And this is the kind of co-design process which we did not implement in the first project I shared with you. 
about urban renewal in Albany and Troy. We just worked with the New York State Office for Historic Preservation. We didn't work with the end users. We didn't work with the community. And I think that's part of why that project wasn't taken up. I think working with the end user, working with the community helps to increase uptake of a project. And I've seen that in other cases of projects we made using these methods too, because it, it develops um, real ownership of the project by the community when you actually work together. Um, it also helps ensure the project's relevance and usefulness for the community. So I, recommend, I really recommend this kind of co-design approach as opposed to things like user stories and personas and so forth. Even though it takes longer and it's messier, I think it is more meaningful and ultimately more successful. And then these are some strategies that have been useful. Uh, if you're an educator like me and you're thinking about making a course like this, I think um, it's important to network beforehand, to make a course structure that doesn't just benefit the faculty member, but benefits everybody. Again, I said implement a co-design process, build in time for reflection, use digital project management tools that can really be a lifesaver. Ultimately, the faculty member should fade away, I think, during the course. That is a sign of success. The students in my course could uh, demo for the mayor on their own without me taking the lead. I think that's good. But then the faculty member needs to not fade away, I think, and be available for the long haul. If communities want to up, take up projects like this and finish them for the public, um, that can mean a several year collaboration. Um, and a couple of other pedagogical things, which I mentioned earlier, are there. So just as a final, uh, a final slide here to bring us back to Jane Jacobs, uh, who described herself as a habitual optimist. Jacobs reminds us of the precarity of history and memory in her final book, Dark Age Ahead. She says, writing, printing, and the internet give a false sense of security about the permanence of culture. Most of the million details of a complex living culture are transmitted neither in writing nor pictorially. Instead, cultures live through word of mouth and example. And this notion that the permanence of culture has little to do with objects or abstracted knowledge as in text or inscription, but rather the oral tradition and, and example, which I think she means by that experience, participation. Here, I think games can offer us something unique in their playful approach, but also in the process of their development when a co-design method is used. Game designer Raf Koster famously says, the best game of all is game design. And I think the experience of participating in the design of these experiences together for the middle school students, for the teachers, the community members, for me and my students too, this may be the most meaningful part where true participation beyond simple interactivity is happening with and between people. Thank you. <laughs>